let's go ahead and um, look at Le Chatelier's principle. And we'll come back to this uh, teeter-totter analogy again, because uh, the key here is after applying a stress, you need to know in which direction the reaction proceeds after the, st after the stress as it tries to establish a new equilibrium. That's the key in doing the um, activity. You apply a stress and the, um, Q, the products over reactant isn't equal to Q equilibrium anymore. It's equal to um, Q, okay? It's not equal to the equilibrium constant. It's equal to Q. So as Q now goes back and tries to adjust itself to equal K equilibrium, which way will the reaction move? Will it produce more product or will it uh, produce um, convert back to reactant? You guys have to be able to predict that or maybe there's no change at all. Okay, and then you need to indicate whether or not the moles of the product goes up or the moles of the product goes down or doesn't change. If the moles of the reactant goes up or the moles of the reactant goes down or no change. And I'll try and explain that to you because there is a difference. And I stress this again, there is a difference between concentration and moles. You can change the concentration, but your moles can stay constant. That's especially true if you have a solid or a liquid, okay? The uh, moles are gonna, the, the moles are actually going to change when you get more solid or more liquid, but the concentration is constant because the volume changes proportionally. So when you guys do the activity this week, depending on which lab you have, if you're taking a lab at Miramar, there is a question in there that says, indicate whether the concentration goes up or goes down, indicate whether the moles goes up or goes down. If the reaction is shifting to the right, no matter what, the moles go up. The concentration is constant if it's a solid or a liquid, okay? So hopefully you guys will get that in this discussion that we are going to be talking about today that way. So we're talking about Le Chatelier's principle and we're, we're basically looking at, a re you guys already know about the reaction quotient. The reaction quotient Q tells you what the products of a reactant happens to be under non-equilibrium state, okay? And Q is an indicator of which way the reaction is going to proceed as the reaction tries to go back to equilibrium. If Q is less than K equilibrium, the reaction is going to move in the forward direction, more product will form. Because only by producing more products and decreasing the reactant does Q value increase. On the other hand, if Q is greater than K equilibrium, then the reaction is moving in the reverse direction because Q needs to get smaller. Only when the product decreases and the reactant increase does that quantity, um, products over reactant, get small. So again, I, uh, as we discussed from previous last week, Q is an indicator that tells you the direction of the reaction. And this is a summary right here, okay? Um, so you can have a question like this. We have an equilibrium constant, it's 0.19. And you might say to yourself, but I thought it was 0.2 some, or, or 0.4 something in a previous problem. It's going to change with temperature. So that's why I'm quoting the temperature here. At 532, the K equilibrium is 0.19, okay? This is the Haber reaction. Now we have these initial concentrations, and the question is, in which direction will the reaction proceed? So these are the concentrations under non-equilibrium conditions. All we've got to do is put this into the mass action expression, products of a reactant, and you can see that this value is greater than K equilibrium, therefore, the reaction is not going to form more ammonia. It's actually going to form more um, nitrogen and hydrogen. The reaction is going to proceed in the reverse direction because Q now is greater than K equilibrium. And you can use this monomic device where you have a number line. You put Q down, 4.2. You put K equilibrium, 0.19. And so in order for Q to match K equilibrium, it's got to go from right to left. 
Okay, it's got to go from right to left. When it goes from right to left, then you have the reaction moving in the reverse direction. Okay. Um, just real quick. Okay, just uh, making sure that there's nothing on the chat. Let's go take a look at uh, this right here. So this concept was introduced by French Louis Le Chatelier, okay? And it's called Le Chatelier's Principle. It's based on the equilibrium law. It simply states that when you have a reaction at equilibrium, it has to be at equilibrium and then you upset that equilibrium, the reaction is going to respond as to establish a new equilibrium. So if you apply a stress, whether you're adding more products or you're adding more reactant, or maybe you're increasing the temperature, or maybe you're changing the pressure by changing the volume of the vessel, these are known stresses, then the reaction responds by re converting that stress, that excess, into something else um, and reducing that, that, that added chemical or that added stress so that an equilibrium is established again. Sometimes you don't add chemicals, sometimes you remove chemicals, in which case we call it a deficit. If you have a deficit, let's say you're removing reactant or removing product, or maybe you're cooling down the temperature or reducing the pressure by making the volume bigger, then the reaction again will respond because now you're not at equilibrium. Whenever you upset the system so you're not at equilibrium anymore, then the reaction will try to get back to equilibrium and it'll shift. The reaction will shift either to more products or more reactant until it gets back to equilibrium. That's the whole idea of Le Chatelier's principle, okay? And in today's lab, you guys will see that at work. When you have a reaction, you're, look, you're investigating a reaction, maybe it's chromate, dichromate, and you add more acid, you'll see that the reaction through its observation, through the observation that you take, is actually converting some of that reactant to more products, dichromate. And you notice that by the observation that you take, by the color change. And that, you, that way you know that the, re, the reaction is shifting. And then when the reaction stops, and that's almost instantaneous, you've got a new equilibrium. And if you can take the concentrations at that point in time and put it back into the mass action expression, it'll equal to the same old equilibrium constant that you had previous to that stress provided that you didn't change the temperature, okay? And that's the magical thing about Le Chatelier's principle. You can actually control the experiment so you can get more products if that's what you're after, or you can reduce the amount of product this form if you're trying to inhibit that reaction, okay? So um, let's take a look at this teeter-totter analogy because again, I wanna, give you a visual. It does, it helps to know the math and helps to know the concept, but it's also good to have a visual of the basic idea so that um, for quick questions, you, you could um, double check. So like I said, when you have a balance in this teeter-totter an analogy right here, it means that the rate forward and the rate reverse are equal. Now, what happens when you apply a stress? Let's say you have you apply more stress on the product side. So that basically means that in this teeter-totter analogy, the balance is disturbed. You're more weighted down on the right side. The only way to get back to balance is by taking some of the product and convert it back, converting it back to reactant. And so what we can say here is that the reaction shifts to the left. So we have to take that excess and convert it to the other side in order to establish equilibrium. So that's why I like to use a teeter-totter analogy because you can actually visualize what's going on, okay? So here it is again. Here we're putting a stress on the reactant side. So maybe you're loading the reaction, the reaction vessel with more reactant. 
And so there's a stress there. And so the reaction has to shift to the right. More product has to form in order for equilibrium to be re reestablished. Let's take a look at this right here. Uh, let's say that we have a deficit. So what this means is that we remove some of the reactant. So in this teeter-totter analogy, the reactant side, the left side gets lighter and the right side is heavier. So again, we are not at equilibrium. In order for this to go back to equilibrium, some of that product has to convert over to reactant and make up for that deficit. And only then do you get back to equilibrium. So we, you can see that if we have a deficit on the reactant side, then the reaction will shift to the left. The reaction will shift to favor the reactant side as it tries to go back to equilibrium, okay? So uh, again, it's, it's a good visual because it shows you, based on what you know about teeter-totter seesaws, uh, how to balance things out. And that's what happens in the chemical world. When you have, when you remove a reactant, the product will convert back to reactant to establish that equilibrium constant again. Here's another example. When you put a stress on the product, of course, the reaction is going to shift to the left. When you have a deficit on the product, the reaction will shift to the right. It's always trying to establish that ratio so that Q equals K equilibrium, okay? So uh, let's change gears because we've already changed. We, you guys already know what happens when you change the um, amount of reactant and, and products. And remember, these only apply for gas and aqueous phase. If you add a solid, and in the reaction, it's a solid, and you add more chemicals, nothing happens to the equilibrium constant. Why? Because the solid is not in the mass action expression. Only those chemicals that are shown in the mass action expression will cause the equilibrium to shift, okay? So if you alter the concentrations of any chemical in the mass action expression, expect the Q value to change, which means that the reaction uh, will either shift to the right or to the left, okay? So I just wanna make that clear because we're coming to a point in, the, in this concept where you guys really need to understand the chemistry, okay? You guys need to understand what's the difference between molarity and moles. What, why does a solid and liquid don't have a change in concentration? And we covered that last time. So let's talk about heat. Okay, um, you know that when you have a reaction, bonds are broken and bonds, bonds are reformed. We talked about that in kinetics. Whenever you're trying to break bonds, that's always going to be an endothermic reaction. You need energy to break the bonds. Whenever bonds form, that's actually exothermic. The energy is released when bonds form, okay? So exothermic reaction, energy is a product energy is released. So let's take a look at this and we can depict an exothermic reaction in terms of this simplistic diagram. Reactant goes to products plus energy because energy is a product in exothermic reaction. So what happens if we increase the temperature for an exothermic reaction? That's like applying stress on the product side. Why? Because energy is a product for an exothermic reaction. If you increase the temperature and Remember that when you have a reaction, you cannot exclusively just change the temperature of the product. It's all in the same vessel. So when you raise the temperature, the temperature goes up for both reactant and product, but the product is more affected because of the way the reaction is written. So when you increase the temperature here, there is a stress on the product. The only way this thing goes back to equilibrium is for the product to convert back to reactant. And so, that's what happens, okay? What, what will happen is that it's going to absorb that energy that was um, put in and um, the reaction shifts to the left. So that's how you would treat an exothermic reaction if the temperature were increased, 
okay? What happens when you have an endothermic reaction and the temperature is increased? Well, again, you're putting a stress on the reactant. Based on the teeter-totter analogy, the reaction will shift to the right and you get more products for an endothermic reaction as you get back to equilibrium. Now, I'll give you the mathematics behind that because when you change the temperature, you don't really change the concentrations, okay? Um, if you take a one molar solution and you change the, the, the temperature, provided the volume doesn't change, you don't really change the um, concentration of that chemical. Remember, mass is conserved. So what exactly happened? Why does the reaction shift to the right or to the left, depending on whether it's endothermic or exothermic? Well, if we're not changing the concentration, and again, look back into the mass action expression. If we're not changing the concentration, then why does the concentration change when we raise the temperature or lower the temperature? That can only be addressed by the fact that the equilibrium constant changes. And we'll talk about that shortly. But before we do, uh, let's take a look at this chart. Remember this chart because in, I think experiment number five or experiment, yeah, experiment number five, the thermodynamics of potassium nitrate, you guys are gonna be using this chart. This chart's also handy for um, one of the experiments in experiment number three, the experiment that we're going to be doing today. What you see here is what we call the solubility uh, chart for different substance. You guys recognize sodium chloride, that's stable salt. You guys should recognize potassium nitrate, okay? These are all ionic substances. And in general, when you take salt and you put it in solution, you put it in water so it dissolves, and you put enough salt in there so that some of it doesn't dissolve, the way you get the other non-dissolved sodium chloride to dissolve is you raise the temperature. And that's what this chart shows you. It shows you the solubility of these substances, these ionic substances. You know it's ionic because they've got a metal and a anion. It shows you the solubility. It says right here, solubility grams of salt in 100 grams of water. So you have 100 grams of water. All these are in 100 grams of water. And look what happens to when you raise the temperature, the solubility goes up. In other words, more of it starts to dissolve in the water. And the biggest, uh, one of the, the chemicals that has the most dramatic solubility versus the temperature change is potassium nitrate. Why do you think we use that particular salt in experiment number five? Okay, but in general, what you see here is that the, when you raise the temperature of a salt, the solubility increase. What does that tell you about the thermicity of the dissolution? Solution again means that you're taking a solid and you're dissolving it in water. What does that tell you about the thermicity, exothermic or endothermic, as a solid goes into solution? Well, you can see that the reaction is going to be uh, a solid going into aqueous form. And if it's moving in the forward direction, that is the solid goes into the aqueous form more appreciably at higher temperature. That means that generally the solubility of these ionic substances is an endothermic reaction. The more you heat it up, the more the reaction proceeds to the right. So we can say that in general, solubility of solids are endothermic, except for cerium sulfate. Look at this weird exception right here. What happens when you raise the temperature of cerium sulfate? You actually don't get more of it dissolving, you get more of it solidifying. In other words, it crystallizes out. The solubility decreases. So for cerium sulfate, would you say it's endothermic or exothermic? And hopefully you guys said it was exothermic because the reaction shifting to the left as you raise the temperature. In other words, uh, more solid is being formed, okay? So you can use this chart actually to figure out how much of the chemical is in solution 
depending on the temperature. Okay, and you will use this chart again, uh, probably not in this chapter when we do experiment number five. Okay, so let's take a look at the gases. Uh, the, that previous discussion was for a solid that dissolves in water. Let's take a look at a gas solubility. That is, we have carbon dioxide and we're trying to put it in water. So we're trying to get carbonated beverage. Okay, and the question is, is the solubility of a gas endothermic or exothermic? All you've got to do really to answer that question is think about your favorite beverage. It might be a, a beer, might be something that's carbonated, a soda. Okay, and it's initially under pressure. That's why the carbon dioxide is dissolved in, in the uh, solution there. But you release the pressure, you start to see it fizz because now it's uh, the pressure has been reduced. But more importantly, in order to keep the carbonation, do you stick it in the refrigerator or you put it out in the warm um, sunny day like what we have today? Uh, does it go flat when you stick it out in the sun or does it go flat when you stick it in the fridge? And you guys know the answer to that question. At higher temperature, you see more bubbles, okay? So that means that the reaction, uh, the, the gas is, is the, the gas in solution, the gas in solution. The way we want to see this is through the following reaction. Solubility of gas is in equilibrium with the solute. You can think of the solute as carbon dioxide, okay? So carbon dioxide gas versus carbon dioxide in water. If you put it in warm water, or you put it in a warm room, in which direction will this equilibrium shift? Do you think more of the gas will go into solution or more of the gas will start fizzing out? And you guys know it's gonna start fizzing out. So that means that the solubility of a gas is actually an exothermic process, okay? So solubility of a gas is exothermic process. When you heat it up, what you have is more gas coming out of solution. You should try this at home. I, I usually, um, when my daughter was younger, I used to fascinate her with science. Now she's off, she's um, 24 years old and it didn't seem like chemistry stuck in her mind because she became a journalist. Anyway, um, but one of the things that I used to do to kind of fascinate her is uh, I would get some 7-Up beverage and um, I would take a um, paper clip. I usually have a paper clip. I'm usually grading paper. And then I would heat up that paper clip in the um, candle. You know, there's usually a dining candle there. I'll, I'll make it hot. Okay. And then I'll take that paper clip that is warm and then I'll stick it into the 7 Up. And all of a sudden, what you'll see is that 7 Up starting to fizz out. The bubbles will go everywhere, depending on how heat hot that paper clip is. If you have a spoon, you can do the same thing. Take the spoon, heat it up, and then stick it in your beverage. And what you'll see is that the, the carbon dioxide will come out of solution. And you're basically establishing this equilibrium right here. You're applying heat to the carbon dioxide that's in solution. The equilibrium will shift to the left. More of the gas will try and escape. That's what's going on. Okay. So uh, next time you're trying to entertain uh, a younger brother or sister, or maybe your own kid, be careful, of course. Uh, you can do that little little trick. And basically, that's just Le Chatelier's principle at work, okay? So we know that solubility of gas is an exothermic process. So we can take a look at this right here, and you can see that energy is a product when we're talking about the solubility of gas. The gas, uh, is to the left and the gas in solution is to the right. It's an exothermic process. When we apply heat, the, the gas inside the solution will come out of solution until you establish a new equilibrium. That's what's going on. And then here's the little monomic, the uh, demonstration that I have. This, I don't know what this is. It's probably a piece of metal that is heated and it starts to cause the uh, beverage, the carbonated beverage to fizz. Okay, um, so let's take a look at this video real quick because I want to show you that solubility of gas is a real problem. 
uh, in this particular instance, the solubility of carbon dioxide, remember there's a lot of carbon dioxide in our, our ocean. It's dissolved in there because carbon dioxide can go into water. But if you upset it, it can't come out. So let's take a look at this movie real quick. Cameroon, West Africa, 1986. In the northwest corner of the country lies Sabon, a busy marketplace that will soon be a ghost town. Here, a tragic event will tear our region apart, throw a government into crisis, and reveal an astonishing new scientific phenomenon. The village is six miles away from Lake Neos, the lifeline for this village. But in the early hours of August 21st, death rises out of this lake. Father Anthony Bangsy was a missionary in the village at the time. Today, he's still trying to make sense of what happened. It remains very, very fresh in my mind. It was completely invisible. We could only know there was danger when you saw birds falling down and dying, the animals dying around. You couldn't see clearly. The night of August 20th, Bangzi finishes work and goes back to the room he shares with his colleague and mentor, Father Lawrence. Mm -hmm. It happened when we were asleep. We must have uh, woke up and opened the door and went out to get A. Because like we were suffocating inside and thought that outside we'll feel freer opened the door ourselves and went out. I found myself lying out the next day beside our house. I found Lawrence too there, and uh, I was there lying beside him. Father, father. I tried to ask him what we were doing out because father. I didn't know what had happened and he wouldn't say anything, wouldn't utter a word, and I tried. There was no way to speak even. I had lost the power of speech, kind of, and then it was difficult to move. I was really dangling like I would fall. Father Lawrence passes away that night. Father Bangsy is one of only a few to survive. In Sabum, 500 are dead. Five miles away in the village of Neos, only six out of a population of 800 survive. Other nearby villages also suffer huge casualties. In just a few hours, nearly 2,000 people have been killed. And no one knows why. Well, the reason why is because in Lake Neos, uh, remember that Lake Neos is actually a, um, a Cameroon is actually a lake in a, um, a crater, and it's a very deep crater, and uh, there's a lot of dissolved carbon dioxide in there. There must have been an earthquake or something upset the balance. So that now the carbon dioxide, it's like opening up your, your beverage, all the gas escape. Because carbon dioxide, look at the uh, molar mass. There's two oxygens there and one carbon. It has a molar mass of 44 grams per mole. Versus oxygen, which is uh, two oxygen, 32 grams per mole. Carbon dioxide is much more dense than oxygen. So it's going to hug the, the, the surface. And as it rolls down that mountain, it hugs the surface. And then anyone near the, the bottom towards the surface are going to, the, the carbon dioxide is going to displace the oxygen 
and then there's no, no oxygen to breathe. If you're higher up, then maybe you have some oxygen um, because again, the carbon dioxide is heavier, more dense than the oxygen. So maybe you could, you could survive, but that's basically what, what happened there, okay? Uh, well, it's a tra tragedy, uh, but, not, but they figured out what was going on. Anyway, let's get back to chemistry. Um, in this particular, like, we asked the question last time, when we change the temperature of a reaction, we're not really adding or taking away chemicals. We're not changing the concentration. So why does the equilibrium get upset when we change the temperature? And the answer goes to this right here, okay? When we have an endothermic react reaction or an exothermic reaction, the only possible way for the reaction to be out of balance is for K equilibrium to not equal the equilibrium at the previous temperature. The equilibrium owed is not the new equilibrium at the new temperature. And so therefore the products over reactant doesn't equal to that new equilibrium under that new temperature. Because the products over reactant still equal the old equilibrium, which is now Q then the reaction has to respond so that Q changes that new equilibrium constant at that new temperature. That's what's going on. The equilibrium constant actually changes when you change the temperature. That's why the reaction shifts to the left or to the right. And so the question is, well, for an endothermic reaction, if you raise the temperature, is the new equilibrium constant bigger or smaller than the old equilibrium constant? And you guys know how to answer that. The reaction's moving in the forward direction when we, for an endothermic reaction when we raise the temperature. If the reaction's moving in the forward direction, that means the new equilibrium is actually higher than the old. The old now is Q, and Q needs to go up, needs to increase in order to equal the new equilibrium constant. That's what's going on in terms of the, the concepts that we have. And so this, the words here kind of tells you something to that effect, okay? It basically says, why does the reaction adjust itself when according to the mass action expression, the concentration of the chemicals are not altered by temperature change? Well, it has to do with the fact that the, Q, the equilibrium constant changes. So here's a summary of what I just said. This is true for endothermic reaction. The new equilibrium constant is going to be bigger than the old equilibrium constant, which is now Q. The reaction proceeds to the right. On the other hand, for an exothermic reaction, if you raise the temperature, the reaction shifts to the left. This endothermic reaction is like when a salt dissolves in water. This exothermic reaction is when you increase the temperature in a carbonated beverage. Okay, What happens is that the old equilibrium constant now becomes Q, the new equilibrium constant is lower than that value and the reaction shifts to the left, okay? So here's what happens when you decrease the temperature. For an endothermic reaction, for an endothermic reaction, look in the right side, the new equilibrium constant is actually smaller than the old. And so the reaction shifts to the left when you decrease the temperature. For an exothermic reaction, look, look right here to the, to the left of this chart. The new equilibrium constant is actually bigger than the old equilibrium constant. And so when you decrease the temperature, the reaction shifts to the right. It's the reason why you put your carbonated beverage after you opened up back in the fridge so that the gas that has escaped that is still on the top layer if you, you, if you cap it off, you can go back into solution, okay? So that's the how, whole idea of temperature change. Temperature change changes the equilibrium constant. So this is a, um, what you guys will do in today's lab. It's the equilibrium between cobalt tetrachloride and, and cobalt hexa, hexa aqua cobalt. So take a look at this, um, the cobalt, tetrachloride is a blue solution. You can see that in this diagram right here. When 
the chlorides come off and is replaced by water, that solution is sort of pinkish, okay? And two complexes of cobalt, a blue chloro complex and a reddish pink hydrated cobaltous ion exist in equilibrium in aqueous solution. We will use the equilibrium between these two colored species to illustrate Le Chatelier's principle. First, a solution containing chloride ion is added. The equilibrium shifts to the left and the solution turns blue due to the formation of more chloro complex. Blue is cobalt tetrachloride, but there's also cobalt with water in there. Now water is added to the equilibrium mixture. This time the solution turns pink because the equilibrium has shifted to the right with the formation of more hydrated cobaltous ion. We will now illustrate the effect of temperature on the equilibrium. When the solution is heated, the equilibrium shifts in the endothermic direction. That is, it shifts to the left, and the solution turns blue because more chloro complex is formed. Re-immersing the tube into the ice water recools it, and in conformity with Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium shifts to the right, and more hydrated cobaltous ion is formed. So this is uh, what you see when the equilibrium is upset. The change in color gives you the clue as to which direction the reaction is shifting, okay? Because without that observation, you don't know. You probably need to go in there and monitor how much cobalt chloride is there or how much cobalt hexa aqua compound is there. But you do so by noticing the physical change. And what you guys will do in your lab is you will make a note of what color these chemicals are. And as it moves to one color or the other, you can now indicate which direction the reaction is shifting. Okay. So um, again, this is just a little preview of the experiment you guys are doing today. Now let's change. Um, to the last concept that I want to cover today, uh, in the Chatelier's principle, what happens when you have a pressure change? And the idea here, remember, that only when you change the concentration, got to go back to that basic idea, only when the concentration changes do you have an upset in the um, mass action expression. Do, does K equilibrium not equal or products over reactant not equal K equilibrium anymore, it's equal to Q, and Q is always chasing K equilibrium. So for a solid and a liquid, these things are already compressed. You are not actually going to upset the equilibrium when you change the pressure for a solid and liquid. And when we say we change the pressure, you change the pressure by taking a reaction vessel like what you see here, and you make the size smaller. When you make the size smaller, moles over volume, okay, the volume gets smaller. That means the concentration increases. But when you make the size smaller for a solid liquid, nothing happens because they're already compressed as they are. This really only applies towards gas, okay? Solids and liquids already are in close proximity. Pressure changes, it's not going to affect the equilibrium. This only really applies to the gas chemical. So let's take a look at the gas. And going back to chapter 11, we go back to Henry's law to figure out what is the partial pressure of a gas based on Henry's constant and the mole fraction of that gas. And this is the equation right here. Okay, go back and review that. The, the idea here is that when you compress a gas, you force it to go into solution. So we can write a reaction that shows gas in equilibrium with gas in solution. And the key here is that which side is sensitive to pressure? Well, the gas side is sensitive to pressure. So when you increase the pressure, the gas, the pressure in the gas side, the reaction is going to go into solution, okay? And I'll try and make this more clear as we proceed here, okay? Um, a diver can 
I want to show you this because, again, <laughs> for those of you who do diving, either recreationally or maybe that's something that, that is your passion, we always pay attention to Henry's law and the solubility of a gas as we go deeper into the water. And the reason why is because deeper depth means higher pressure, means that any gas in our body will go into solution. And what is the solution in our body? Blood. So uh, when we breathe in oxygen, we also breathe in nitrogen because air is oxygen and nitrogen. So when we go deeper in depth, as we go diving, the gas, the oxygen, and nitrogen will get dissolved in our blood. That's not so bad of a problem. It's actually when we elevate, as we make the, our ascent, and the gas pressure decrease, okay? As gas pressure decrease, those gas in our blood will come out of solution and go back as a gas. But sometimes it's not very clean. Sometimes uh, in the process of going from being dissolved in our blood to being a gas particle again, it forms bubbles. And that's the bends. So let's take a look at this right here. A diver can regulate pressure in her lungs by breathing out as she ascends, but must be wary of other laws of physics that are at play under the sea. Henry's law states that the amount of a gas that dissolves in a liquid is proportional to its partial pressure. The air a diver breathes is 78% nitrogen. At a higher pressure under the sea, the nitrogen from the air in a scuba tank diffuses into a diver's tissues in greater concentrations than it would on land. If the diver ascends too quickly, this built-up nitrogen can come out of solution and form microbubbles in her tissues, blood, and joints, causing decompression sickness, aka the bends. This is similar to the fizz of carbon dioxide coming out of your soda. Gas comes out of solution when the pressure is released, but for a diver, the bubbles cause severe pain and sometimes even death. Divers avoid falling victim to the bends by rising slowly and taking breaks along the way, called decompression stops, so the gas has time to diffuse back out of their tissues and to be released through their breath. So if you ever get certified for diving, this is one of the things that they really stress in terms of uh, making sure when you make your ascent. Anyway, um, let's take a look at the teeter-totter analogy. Here we have a gas versus a gas in solution. Wherever there's a, um, so here's the reaction. Gas, solute, gas in solution, okay? And so what we need to do is P does not stand for pressure. P stands for solid, okay? I mean, P stands for product. So uh, sorry that I used that particular letter to indicate products here, but, but, and it can be confusing for gases, for pressure, but um, we're trying to be consistent here. So look at this re reaction right here. We have a so solute, we have a solute that's dissolved. So the question is when you raise when you increase the pressure, does the equilibrium shift to the left? Go back. Does the equilibrium shift to the left or to the right? And you guys know that when we increase the pressure, the, you can get more of the gas dissolved. When you decrease the pressure, more of it comes out of solution. So the key to this Peter totter analogy is to look at the chemical reaction. Look at the reactant and pay attention only to those chemicals that are in the gas form. Look at the product and pay attention only to those chemicals that are in the gas form. Nothing else matters, only those chemicals in the gas form. And then whichever side has the most moles of gas via their coefficient, that's where you put P, P standing for pressure. So in this reaction right here, this is the only gas, so I would put a P right here for pressure and so when you apply, when you have more pressure, the reaction puts a stress on the reactant, the reaction will, will proceed to the right. On the other hand, when you remove pressure, so there's a deficit on the left side, the reaction will shift to the left and more gas will start to come out of solution. So the key here is to, again, to use this theta totter analogy. 
is look at the overall chemical reaction, make sure it's balanced, and note which side has the most moles of gas via its coefficient in the balance equation. That's where you put P to indicate pressure. Now, if both sides have equal moles of gas, then guess what? Neither side is going to be affected by pressure increase or pressure decrease, okay? It's only the side that has the most moles of gas that you guys are going to look at in terms of whether it's a reactant or a product. And then you can use the teeter-totter analogy. But the teeter-totter analogy is only for you guys to visualize what's going on. What's really happening is the following. Let's take a look at this. We have the Haber reaction right here, nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia, okay? And let's say that we're at equilibrium, and these are the concentrations at equilibrium in a one liter vessel. So everything is found in one liter container. You've got hydrogen, 0 0.1207 molar, you've got nitrogen, 0 0.0402 molar, and you've got ammonia, 0 0.00272 molar. And if you take all that, stick it in the mass action expression, you get an equilibrium constant, okay? You get an equilibrium constant. So that equilibrium constant, for this particular example is 0.105. Now suppose you take your vessel and let's say that you can change the volume by, by maybe putting in a plunger in there. So the, the volume is half its value. So it's not one liter anymore, it's 0.5 liters. What happens to the concentration of those gas at that reduced volume? Guess what? When you have the moles and the moles is constant because you can't create matter, unless you add to it, and you can't destroy it, but you have changed the volume. So the concentration actually doubles when you reduce the volume in half. And that's what you see right here. That's what it's telling you right here. When the volume now is reduced by half, the initial volume, then the molarities are going to double. This 0.1207 molar for hydrogen is now 0.2414. This 0 0.0402 for nitrogen is now 0 0.0804. And this 0 0.00272 molar for ammonia is now 0 0.00544. The concentration changes when you change the volume of a gas. Okay, that's key. That's key. And you can only change pressure when you change the volume for this uh, concept to work. Okay, so usually the question is, what happens to the equilibrium when you change the pressure by increasing the volume of the container or decreasing the volume of the container? You need to indicate the change in volume because you're changing the concentration for the gas, for the gas. So if you now plug this, these quantities into the mass action expression, look what you have. That value is smaller than the old equilibrium constant. Now, the equilibrium constant hasn't changed. We haven't changed the temperature, but the concentration has changed. And now it's smaller than 0 0.105. Therefore, the reaction has to proceed to the right side. And say we say the reaction uh, shifts to the right. But let, take a look at this reaction again. See this Haber reaction? We've got one mole of gas of nitrogen, three moles of gas for hydrogen. So there's four moles of gas on the reactant side and there's only two moles of gas on the product side based on the coefficient of the balance equation. Therefore, we would put P, the left side, is more sensitive to pressure. An increase in pressure to this overall reaction therefore shifts the reaction to the right based on that Peter totter analogy. A decrease in pressure will cause this reaction to shift to the left because why? Because the left side is more sensitive to pressure. So that's what I mean by, by paying attention, but by the fact that the math agrees with the concept. Okay, the math agrees with the concept. So this is a summary of temperature for an endothermic and exothermic reaction, sorry. Okay, and this is a summary for pressure, depending on which side pressure, well, for the solubility of a gas. But if you have any chemical reaction, always pay attention to the balance equation and note which chemicals are gas because that's the side that's going to be, the most most of that gas is going to be the side that's sensitive to pressure, okay? So the rest of this is just the, um, a summary of Le Chatelier's principle.
Okay, I apologize for the fact that the um, it's not very clear. I'll try and find a better image of that. But that's a summary of Lachalet's principle. This is the equilibrium being established. You can apply a stress or a deficit by varying the concentration, that is adding or removing the chemicals. You can apply a stress depending on uh, the temperature, but you change the equilibrium constant there. You can apply a stress when you change the pressure by changing the volume. Let me give you one more hint. If you have a reaction vessel, let's go back to this right here. Okay, let's go back to this, this reaction right here. Let's say we have the reaction, the Hebrew reaction, nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia. And I changed the overall pressure of that container by adding argon gas. So argon is an inert gas. It's not going to react with any of these chemicals. But now I, it looks like the total pressure is increased. Well, the key there is that the total pressure is increased, but the partial pressure of these chemicals are not. Remember, the partial pressure is based on the moles of the chemical divided by the mole fraction. Argon's an inert gas, plus argon is not in the mass action expression. Adding argon to a reaction in which that gas is not involved in the equilibrium does nothing to the equilibrium. The reaction stays the same. Okay, so the only way you guys are going to shift the um, equilibrium for chemicals that have gas phase in it is by actually changing the size of the reaction vessel, making squishing the gas or giving the gas more room to move around. Adding an inert gas does not do it, okay, because that inert gas is not in the mass action expression. So uh, let me go ahead and um, talk to you about this. This is a um, chart that you will see in your activity this week. And this is a typical example of a question I have. Here we have the reaction. This is a photosynthesis reaction. Water and carbon dioxide produces glucose and oxygen. So the fact that it's photosynthesis, you guys need to use your science knowledge as to whether this is an endothermic or exothermic. I'm not going to tell you that because you, you, you as science students already know whether a photosynthesis uh, reaction is endothermic or exothermic. I'm not going to tell you that. Then take a note of the phases of these chemicals, which side has more moles of gas, which side has the least number of gas. Pay attention to the phases. And this is the typical question that I, I will have. These are the stress, remove carbon dioxide, which direction will the reaction shift to? Will it go to the left, will it go to the right? And then, you need to indicate for each one of these chemicals in the reaction, will the number of moles increase or decrease? Let me just say that whenever the reaction is moving to the right, it means more product is forming. That means more moles is being produced. Whenever the reaction is moving to the right, it means that the reactant is decreasing. It means that more moles is going to be depleted. Okay, if the reaction is shifting to the left, more reactants are being formed, more products are being depleted, depleted. That is the mass quantity. That is the moles are going to change. On the other hand, concentration is different because concentration is related to the moles over the volume. So that's the second part right here. Is the reaction is the concentration of water, carbon dioxide, glucose, and oxygen going to increase or decrease? Okay. So remember that for a solid and a liquid, concentration does not change no matter what. Even if the moles increase, the volume changes proportionally. And then the ch temperature change, you need to indicate whether or not, uh, if this is an endothermic reaction, if it's moving if it's an endothermic reaction, if the reaction is moving from left to right, that means temperature is dropping because it's consuming the energy. If this is an exothermic reaction, it's moving from left to right, that means energy is being produced. So this really should be energy rather than temperature. Is energy being produced or is energy being uh, uh, absorbed? That's, that's what this thing is. So take a look at this. This is just... Um, in there for you guys to think about, okay? And then I'll show you the answer next time. It's not an extra credit or anything. It's just something that 
you guys will definitely see in your next exam. So it's a practice. Okay. So um, we're done for today. Next time we go into another heavy duty math. Today was mostly about conceptual cases and relates very much so to the um, activity that we're doing this week. So hopefully some of you who are in lab took out your activity and were able to look at those questions so that you can answer some of those um, questions that are in activity based on our discussion, especially this type of question right here. Um, are there any questions? I'll post the solution to that um, problem that I uh, put out last week so you guys can see the answer. If there is nothing else, then I think we are done. For those of you in lab, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the experiment today, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the activity that's scheduled for, for Wednesday. Um, otherwise, uh, you guys have a good rest of your evening, Monday, and we'll see you next time.